Hi, and welcome to me, Jennifer Valentine Miller, on the Jennifer Valentine Miller Show. Once again, in the midst of so much talk in the news, whether it's about the gender identity debate and our young people, mental health, the cost of living crisis versus too much money in sport. So as you all know, this talk show does come from a biblical perspective. And the question is, was it due to the Roman Empire's vast extent and long endurance that the institutions and culture of Rome, which allowed it to have a profound and lasting influence on philosophy, law and forms of government in the territory governed, does this still affect us today? Also, the Latin language of the Romans evolved into the Romance languages of the medieval and modern world, while medieval Greek became the language of the Eastern Roman Empire. The empire's adoption of Christianity led to the formation of medieval Christendom, which gives us back the love for the Bible. Romans 1 1 identifies the Apostle Paul as the author of the letter to the Romans. The early church universally accepted Paul's authorship of this letter and according to the author Harrison Everett in the NIV Bible Commentary Volume 2 it says from the post apostolic church to the present with almost no exception this letter has been credited to the Apostle Paul. The only issue with the authorship concerns the issues of the Amaru Enesis, or the secretary, who did the actual writing of the letter. Sometimes an Amaru Enesis would write from a general outline, while other times they would take dictation. In Romans 16.21, Territorus of Iconium Greek is identified as the one who serves as the actual writer of the letters. And the author Douglas Moo in the Epistle of the Romans says that it is most likely that Territus was taking dictations since the style of the writing is so close to that of Galatians and 1 Corinthians. In Romans 1 7, Paul identifies the audience of this letter as believers in Rome. And the Apostle writes this letter to Rome, at least in part, as an introduction to them. He had never been in Rome, but was hoping to stop there for a while on a future trip to Spain. And that can be found in Romans 15, 23 to 24. According again to the author Mounts in the New American Contemporary on Romans, it is likely that he was looking for some support from this church and he ventured further and further to the west. The letter would appear to have been written at the end of the third missionary journey. In Romans 15, 25 to 29, he tells the Romans that he's, he's the one or he's on his way to Jerusalem with a gift from the believers in Greece and that once he finishes his plans would be to head to Rome and then Spain. It is commonly accepted according to the author Mu that Paul wrote this letter during three months he was in Corinth as recorded in Acts 22 to 3. It is hard to know definitely what Paul's purpose was in writing this letter. It likely was a combination of things that promoted its writing. Among these would be his upcoming trip to Spain. He was planning to pass through Rome on the way and it seemed hopeful of support while there. And it may well be, as the author Mount says, that he was looking for a long-term relationship with them as he was in Spain and he was working there. A relationship like what he had enjoyed with Antioch while working in the eastern part of the empire. In connection with a possible hope for support, Paul may well have been laying out the gospel he preached. 
There were many that Paul had contended with over the years who may have been spreading falsehood about him, as can be found in Romans 3.8. So this letter could have been at least in part to prove his orthodoxy. And finally, chapters 14 and 15 also point to there being problems within the church that he was hoping to be able to connect and correct. The theme of Romans has been a topic of debate over the centuries. Some claim it can be justification by faith. Others feel that it primarily concerns upon union with Christ. And still others see the theme as incorporating Gentiles into God's people within the continuity of salvation's history. Authors argue that the theme of Romans is the gospel. It is said that the bulk of the Romans focuses on how God has acted, Christ, to bring the individual sinner into a new relationship with him, in chapters 1 to 4, to provide for that individual eternal life in glory and to transform that individual's life on earth now. Books 12 to 1 and 15 to 13. While the culture of the first century Roman world is different from today, what the Apostle Paul has to say is extremely relevant. Paul's focus in Romans is on two aspects of salvation. The first aspect concerns how we can be right standing before God. Paul tells us that that justification is being declared righteous and is by faith alone, apart from any action on our part, as in Romans 3.28, that our faith is to be in Jesus. And when one places their faith in Christ, the righteousness of God is imputed to their account, as in Romans 3, 21 to 22. Right standing or justification is a gracious gift of God given to us through faith. It's not something we either earn or deserve. The second aspect of salvation Paul discusses is frequently called sanctification. And it is an ongoing walk with the Holy Spirit. He, he emphasises the importance of this in chapter 8 of Romans. And he provides practical instruction for how to walk with the Spirit in Romans 12, 1, 15, 13. Romans 1, 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So the people are without excuse. And it continues in Romans 3, 21 to 22a, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ and to all who believe. There's Romans 4, 3. So what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Another popular scripture from the book of Romans 6, 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called upon according to his purposes. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. 
this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to at least test and prove that God's will is, is good and it is pleasing and it is a perfect will. And finally, Romans 13, 14 says, rather than clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. And that concludes for us the book of Romans.